God welcomes all strangers and friends. God's love is strong and it never ends. God welcomes all strangers and friends. God's love is strong and it never ends. Good morning. This morning at First Congregational Church of the North Yarra. Uh, a warm welcome to those who are here in the sanctuary with us as well as those joining us online. Uh, before we begin our worship, uh, let us have any uh, non announcements uh, to be shared with the congregation. Tuesday gals will not be meeting this Tuesday. So don't show up if you want to see us. Thank you. No Tuesday gals. Any other words? Annual meeting directly after this worship service. Reminder of the annual meeting directly after worship. Right here. Okay, today we are in the midst of what is called the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity. Uh, it's an annual observance that's been going on for 115 years. Uh, the founders deliberately chose this week to begin with a feast of commemoration of the confession of Peter and end with the feast that commemorates the conversion of Paul. Peter and Paul were really the, considered by many the founders of the church, very different in their own personalities, but united in Christ. And so this week we remember the unity of the church around the world. Psalm 27 calls us to worship. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I ask of the Lord, that will I seek out. To live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord. And to inquire in his temple. Our opening hymn, he picks up that theme, I love your church, O oh Lord. If you are able, please stand as we sing together. <laughs>
education. Great God, we acknowledge your presence among us and the ways you can access as a community. Make us receptive to your voice and instruments of your love in the world. Thrill us with your majesty and inspire us with your ability. We rejoice in this gathering as we bless your holy name in the assembly, gathered across time and space as your people. We see you. We're grateful to find you. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. Stay at peace with one another. You may be seated. And at this time, I have a message for children. Come on forward. prayer uh, for transformation is drawn from the theme of this year's week of prayer for Christian unity. Do good and seek justice. Taken from Isaiah chapter 1. We are invited to confess our sins with the words of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah addressed God's people, comparing them to Sodom and Gomorrah. When you come to appear before me, who asked this from your hand? Trample my courts no more. Bringing offerings is futile. Incense is an abomination to me. Forgive us, Lord, when we come to worship without walking humbly before you. New moon and Sabbath and calling of convocation I cannot endure solemn assemblies with iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed festivals, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. We ask forgiveness for the complicity of your people in the evils of injustice felt around the world. 
When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. We ask forgiveness for our sins of omission and silence that fail to honor and support the diversity and harmony of all creation. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. As we have been washed clean in the living waters of baptism, forgive us anew and reconcile us to one another and to creation. Come now. Let us argue it out, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. God, in your mercy, free us from our sins so that we can do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. God hears our prayers, has mercy on us, and forgives our sins. Thanks be to God.
appropriate prayer as we turn to the gospel for today. Fill me up with the Holy Spirit. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. The Gospel of our Lord. Let us pray. Lord, often we feel like we are in the dark. Lift us into the glorious light of your presence. Change our hearts and minds so that we may know the truth that sets us free. Free to respond to your call. Follow me. We are in the season of the church year known as the season after Epiphany. It has a twofold theme. One is discipleship, what it means to follow Jesus. The other is mission, what it means to reach out around us. Today's gospel reading tells of the beginning of Jesus' ministry and the calling of his first disciples. We're told after the arrest of John the Baptist, Jesus began his ministry, picking up the same message, repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. Then Jesus called Peter and Andrew and James and John, follow me and I will make you fishermen, fishers of men. As Matthew tells it, immediately they left all and followed Jesus. That seems a little bit strange until we realize that this was actually not the first time that these men had met Jesus. As we read the Gospel of John, we find that they had originally been followers of John the Baptist, who had pointed to Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And they went and sought after Jesus. And now Jesus calls them to become his disciples. Follow me. My friend, a New Testament professor, Scott McKnight, is, has a new translation of the New Testament coming out this summer. And in his translation, he takes the Greek word that we usually think of as disciples and translates it instead as apprentices. Jesus is calling these men to be his apprentices. And they became not merely disciples, but he named them later as apostles. They went from apprentice to journeyman to missionaries. In the same way, Jesus calls us to follow and learn from him. 
We count first apprentices, then journeymen, and finally ambassadors to move from being citizens of God's kingdom to becoming ambassadors for God's kingdom. Last week I began a series from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In the first two verses we were reminded that God's, God's grace is all we need. Just think, Paul wrote. We have everything we need. And it ended in verse 9. God is faithful. By him, you have been called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. In other words, we have been called into fellowship and followership of Jesus. This morning I continue that with 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. Having been called to follow Jesus, what's the most, the first and perhaps most important thing we need to know? So Paul wrote, Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Oh, yes, I, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptize anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So Paul wrote. The first thing we need to understand as followers of Jesus is the importance of our unity in Christ. That's an appropriate reminder as we observe this week of prayer for Christian unity. And as later we meet as a congregation in annual meeting. As I shared in this week's e-news, my home denomination, the Evangelical Covenant Church and the United Church of Christ share the motto, Conjuncti in Christo, united in Christ. Now the immediate prompt of Paul's letter to the Corinthians was a report that he had received about divisions and factions in the church. And he appealed to them to be united in the same mind and the same purpose. Divisions in the body of Christ, whether the worldwide church or in any local congregation, are a scandal and a hindrance to ministry. The founders of the Week of Prayer of Christian Unity took their cue from Jesus' prayer on the night before he was crucified. Jesus prayed for his disciples. He also prayed for us. From John 17, verses 20 and 21. Jesus prayed, I ask not only on behalf of these, that is, the disciples, but also on behalf, of, on behalf of those who believe in me through their word, that's us, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may, not, may believe that you have sent me. May they all be one. 
Now, now Christian, Christian unity does not require uniformity. Denominations and differences of opinion are not the problem. They're natural, necessary, and sometimes helpful. It's been said that if, if two people agree on absolutely everything, then one of them is not necessary. Now, the problem isn't differences of opinion or de even denominations, it's divisiveness. Jesus' disciples certainly had their own unique personalities and often debated their differences. But denominations also have been helpful. Different styles, different practices have reached more and more people with the good news of God's love. When I was in Worcester, Massachusetts, I enjoyed a, a warm collegiality with the other pastors in our community. But sometimes someone, one of my parishioners or even someone outside from the community would say, come up and say to me, hey, I saw your competition the other day. And I'd say, who is that? And they'd say, Father Riddick from St. Catherine of Sweden. And I would immediately correct him and say, Father George is not my competition. We're on the same team. We just have different positions. I played football. You know, I, I was a lineman. I was on the same team with the quarterback and the other backs and the receivers. We just had different positions. Sometimes, though, you feel closer to the lineman on your opposing team than backs on their own team, especially when, you, when we felt that they, they weren't giving us the credit enough. You know, we had a, we had a, a little ploy that we'd, we'd play, sometimes we'd get together with line, other linemen, and, and uh, we'd, when we didn't think the quarterback was giving us enough credit, we'd pull what we call the lookout block, and that is when the ball was hiked, we'd step to the side and say, look out! <laughs> They soon learned. <laughs> well, we have different positions. We have different roles that we play, but we, we come together and play as a team. Everywhere I've served, I've been a, usually I've sought out and been a part of ecumenical clergy groups. Oftentimes, I've found in many communities there have been two separate clergy groups. One for the mainline churches and another one for the more conservative or evangelical churches. And I'm sa sad to say that oftentimes I was the only person that was in both groups that tried to build those bridges. You see, unity in the wider church, unity in a congregation, doesn't just happen on its own. Eugene Peterson, in the message, translates Paul's plea in this way. I have a serious concern to bring up with you, my friends, using the authority of Jesus. I'll put it as urgently as I can. You must get along with each other. You must learn to be considerate of one another, cultivating a life in common. We cultivate our common life through humility, through consideration for one another, and through commitment to one another. Again, from Peterson, I'll tell you exactly what I was told. You're all picking sides, going around saying, I'm on Paul's side, or I'm for Apollos, or Peter is my man or I'm in the Messiah mood. Note the people who said I belong to Christ were not, were just another faction because they excluded others. There's a popular quote or bumper sticker that says at the end of the day, I'd rather, I'd rather be excluded for who I include rather than included for who I exclude. 
I'd rather be excluded with who I am in truth. Paul goes on, as interpreted by Eugene Peterson, I ask you, has the Messiah been chopped up in little pieces so that we can each have a relic all our own? Was Paul crucified for you? Was a single one of you baptized in Paul's name? I was not involved with any of your baptisms except Crispus and Gaius, and I'm getting this report, I'm sure glad I wasn't. At least no one can go around saying he was baptized in my name. Come to think of it, I also baptized the Stephanus family, but as far as I can recall, that's it. It's a kind of a charming thing about Paul here that, you know, maybe his very human side that he, he's not even sure who he had baptized. Uh, he wasn't keeping count. Why not? Because as he says, God didn't send me out to collect a following for myself, but to preach the message of what he has done, collecting a following for him. In mathematics, we talk about a bounded set and a centered set. And as in math mathematics, so in our common life. A bounded set is defined by the perimeter. Who's in? Who's inside the circle and who's outside the circle? If you draw, think about drawing a circle. Okay, you're in, you're out. That's a bounded set. A centered set is defined by the connection to what's in the center. Doesn't have an outside boundary. It's everybody's directed to the center. Church, that's a bounded set, would be defined by theology and practices. And, and again, say, well, if you agree with these, you're in. If you don't agree, you're out. You're the church should be instead a centered set. We're connected by our relationship to the one who is at the center, Jesus Christ. Whatever other practices and theologies and opinions we have all flow into our relationship to Christ. And so Paul ends by pointing us to Jesus and the cross. The way of sacrificial Paul wrote, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross might not be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Again, I like the clarity of Eugene Peterson's translation. He didn't send me to do it with a lot of fancy rhetoric on my own, lest the powerful action of the center, Christ on the cross, be trivialized into mere words. The message that points to Christ on the cross seems like sheer silliness to those hell-bent on destruction. But for those on the way of salvation, it makes perfect sense. This is the way God works, and most powerfully, as it turns out. This is the way God works in Christ and in and through you and me. In the way of sacrificial love for one another and for the world around us. Here is where we find the path of discipleship as we seek to follow Jesus' way. Here we find our unity in the body of Christ in that kind of love for one another. And here we find our mission as a church to the world around us in the way of sacrificial love. This is the way God works, and most powerfully as it turns out.
contemporary hymn catches the spirit of this kind of relationship with Christ and with one another. Sister, let me be your servant. prayers, um, Pastor Day, for you, your wife, Diana, and your family as she goes to her first appointment. Um, I believe you said it was this Thursday. Thank you. Appreciate that. I have... I see another hand back here. Is it Liz? Oh, oh, Sarah. I have a joy. My very best day one from day one. My best friend is here and with us for the week. fifth birthday this week. I'm thankful that there are 34 members here this morning. <laughs> It has been 
one thing after another, and I pray that this week they get a working vehicle and they can move them on. <laughs> Uh, uh, prayers for my youngest. He, as I had mentioned before, had decided to go to Sun Valley, Idaho and help people up the mountain. Lived on radar. <laughs> but he's struggling out there. He's been sick, uh, just diagnosed with a sinus infection that had been going on for a long time. His roommate had been sick. And his comment was, Mom, this isn't me. <laughs> so prayers for him that he can... Stick it out for the winter season, and I hope he uh, follows through on this isn't me and comes home at the end of the season. And I'll ask prayers for my brothers and sisters in the Evangelical Covenant Church uh, Ministerial Association. They're meeting this week in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, every year. They have what they call a mid-dinner conference. It's a time of continuing education and a time when a lot of boards and committees also meet. Uh, I had been hoping to go this year since I have a brother who lives in Jacksonville, who I haven't seen in a while. Uh, but with Diana's doctor's appointments this week, that took priority. But the prayers for, for my brothers and sisters in, in the Covenant Ministerium. They've been going through a lot of difficulty in the last two years, uh, division over uh, yeah, the uh, same-sex marriage issue. And, uh, it's a, been a thorn, real thorn and uh, praying for, for peace to reign and, and a way to go forward. There's a lot on our uh, prayer plates, you might say, this morning. I also want to share this prayer called Living Psalm 27, written by our colleague Marin Chiribasi, uh, who's a member of the York Association. I am singing it, singing it, singing it. God is light, God is salvation. But there is war in Ukraine. There is terror in Myanmar, grieving in Africa and Yemen, Insurrection in Brazil, memory of insurrection in the U.S. I am singing it, singing it. God is both a stronghold and beauty, but there is XBB 1.5 everywhere, RSV among children, among elders. I am singing it, singing it. God is a shelter. Bear-proof tent, unscalable rock, but all around are storms or fires. Bomb cyclone, hurricane, mudslide, earthquake, disasters from the change of climate. I am singing it, praying it, crying it. Come, God, let me experience your face. My heart seeks you. Do not hide from us. Do not hide away from us in anger. Do not cast us off. Do not forsake us. I am glimpsing it, discovering it, unloosing my hands, opening my life, for I have found your face. Your face is on friend and stranger. Your face is on child and elder. Your face is on the doors I don't want to open. Your face is in my broken mirror. You do not hide from us. You do not turn away from us in anger. You do not cast us off or forsake us. For your face is among us and beside us, suffering with us and strong holding us. So we become beauty, light, tent flap, high butte, a source of your salvation. O oh God, you hear and know the concerns that we have shared and other concerns that are on our hearts. You hear and respond to us in your love. And we respond to you as we pray together the prayer that Jesus has taught us. And so we say, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. When Jesus calls us to be his disciples, he promises to transform the gifts we bring to be used for the glory and kingdom of God. Let us offer our resources in following Christ. Let the ushers come forward to wait for us.
afraid of sacrificial love seems weak and foolish from a worldly point of view, but it is the wisdom and power of God to bring healing and wholeness to us and to the whole world. Go forth in the wisdom and power of God, in the love of Christ, and in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.